Hi, I'm Andrew Wallace, and welcome to the We've Got a Problem podcast, where each week we explore inspiring stories of struggle, success, and solutions to prevalent problems, and how our guests have turned a problem into an opportunity. Today, I'm joined by Joyce Porter, retired professor turned professional actor, voiceover artist, and author. Her new book, Mastering Senior Life, Thriving and Surviving, is aimed at helping seniors enjoy retirement and overcome the inevitable challenges that crop up in the later phases of life. Joyce, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to have you. So uh, give us, I mean, I, I obviously want to talk about the book, but give us some background because obviously you had a history before you became an author, before you wrote this book. How did you get your start? Well, in 1978, I was cast in a play. Uh, I've been acting for many, many years. I taught theater. I taught theater, film, and humanities and speech when I was a professor. And uh, I was cast with a handsome leading man. (laughs) Paul and I were cast as husband and wife and took the parts to heart. (laughs) (laughs) And then you became husband and wife. I mean, so at that that point, you'd already been teaching. You were already a a professor of theater at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You gotta take some of your own advice sometimes. Gotta gotta (laughs) pony up, (laughs) put up or shut up, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So, and, so yeah, you yeah. and Paul got yeah. married and, and obviously lived, lived quite a life and you got into your, into your senior years mm-hmm. and you experienced some challenges. Tell me more about that. Fortunately, I was offered early retirement. I was able to retire at 52, believe it or not. At the time, um, I hesitated and Paul said, I'll just think if you take it, we can spend the winters away and you can try acting full time, which is what I did. And it was fortunate that I was retired because around that time, Paul started developing health problems. And so I had the time to take him to doctor's appointments and deal with that. In addition to trying to balance that with acting and everything. And he did have an amazing number of health problems. It was like, what do I do now? How do I cope with that? I kept learning things as I went along. Part of it was learning from other people. Part of it was learning online. Part of it was the two of us figuring out practical solutions for problems. Like if Paul fell down because his medicine made him dizzy, how do I help a six foot three person get up? And I would have ideas and he'd have ideas and we developed a routine for what we would do. And then later on, he developed more serious problems. He actually wound up with uh, West Nile virus and wound up in the nursing home from that. And I had no idea what goes on in a nursing home or anything about it. And I kept learning these things hard way. And and I said to myself, well, gee, why should other people have to figure this out for themselves? Why don't I start writing some of this down? I actually started with Facebook posts. Okay. And usually I'm posting photos of flowers and (laughs) my walks and everything, which people enjoy. And then I thought, well, are they really going to want to know about things like health problems? And I started putting in a bit. And the reaction I got from people was, yeah, yes, yes, we want to know more about that. And I'd run into people and they'd say, I don't always comment on your Facebook posts but I follow your posts every day. And I found this particular post so interesting. And then one of my friends said, you should really write a book. Well, there you go. Well, that's, I, it's necessity is the mother of invention, right? So you get into these kind of situations. Nobody has prepared you for what's about to happen. You're experiencing it as you go. And at least Paul was there to be a, a partner to you. Like we, we've got to figure something out together rather right. than you trying to figure these things out completely on your own without without some input. But so often I feel like people go into these situations unprepared. And to have a book to to look at to for somebody else who's experienced that or even to know that other people are going through it because we all mm-hmm. go through life thinking we're the only ones experiencing these problems, right? So right. To have a book like that is, is I'm sure, invaluable to, to tons of people. 
Absolutely. Well, I've already, yeah, I've already had people tell me that, that it's been incredibly helpful to them. Well, just this morning, uh, a woman who is in her 80s said, I thought I already knew all that stuff. <laughs> and, you know, she's a very active person. She travels, et cetera. And she said, I have found so many practical tips in your book. I keep it by my bed. I'm reading a chapter every night. And it's, there's just so many things in there. And the book is both a resource if you have problems, but it's also encouragement. Retirement is an opportunity. Well, that's what I want to talk about, right? Retirement is an opportunity to to move forward, to to do all these different kinds of things. We used to talk, well, I used to work in the financial services business. And one of the ways that, that they were talking about retirement being rethought, and this was now uh, 15 years ago was the fact that people need to look at retirement as a transitional phase, as the next phase, not as an end point, as they as they always used to. It's like, I'm stopping work and that's it. Now, you obviously have transitioned into a completely different phase. You've had a couple of different ones, caring for your for your husband, Paul, but then also as a, as a professional actress and, and doing all these kinds of things and your voiceover work. It's, it's just a different thing. And if you, if you frame it that way, is that was one thing, this is a different thing, and now I'm transitioning into this. It's so much more freeing as an opportunity to, to do things. Talk to me about the opportunities that retirement offers. I once read a survey very recently that they surveyed people about when they were happy and how they felt about life. The happiest year was 70 years old. There people you go. Were happiest at 70. Yeah. There you go. How can seniors thrive and survive? I mean, give us give us a taste. What's the secret? Tell me everything, Joyce. I want to know. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, you have to have exercise. You can't be sedentary. And you know how everyone knows you read contradictory health advice. Like one year they say, drink red wine. The next year they say, don't drink red wine. Yep. So eat this. No, don't eat that. Eggs are bad. Eggs are good. But the one thing that is an absolute constant that I've never heard anyone contradict is moderate exercise is good for you. Yeah. And if you are sedentary, it destroys your body. You need to get out and have some exercise and do something active every day. And so if, if it's nice out, I take a walk. If it's not nice out, I'm on Zoom doing an exercise class on Zoom. I'm running up and down my stairs. And as a result, I've got great blood pressure, great heart rate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's very important for the physical. Also, the mental attitude, realizing that you have to say to yourself, wow, this is assuming you have enough money to get by and you're fairly healthy. Wow, I don't have to deal with a boss. I can just do whatever I want to do. This is your opportunity. Maybe you said to yourself, well, gee, when I was a kid, I wanted to do this or that. Oh, I, I, but I never got around to doing it. Well, now you can do it. Okay, let's say you wanted to be a professional dancer. Well, if you start when you're 65 or 70, you're not going to be a professional dancer, but you can still dance. You can still take dance classes. You can't always start a new career when you're retired, but you can be involved in almost any activity you want to. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Talk to me about who your ideal reader would be. Would you want to position this book toward people who are just starting their transition into later middle age? Or would you? <laughs> yes, or would like you? The way you put it, later middle age. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And you know what? Baby boomers are more like late middle age yeah. than they are seniors. I don't feel like a senior. I'm a senior, but I don't feel like a senior. I don't move like a senior, I, you know, et cetera. But absolutely, yeah. The ideal audience, I think, would be someone in their 50s to 70s. I do know people in their 80s and 90s who have gotten tips from the books. The woman in the back of the class who's 90 years old is now moving her arms more and doing larger movements. And she told me that that was due to my book. Well, so there's a big thing there that I want to cover before we go too much further. We're talking about exercise and fitness and things like that, that one of the most important things to be able to do is to be able to get back up off the floor. If you end up down there, 
And we've all ended up down there. I ended up on the floor the other day by surprise, having a plan like you and, and, and your husband had, having a way to get up and keeping your physical fitness in check is huge. Just those little things that you don't realize till later are, are, are big and, and yeah. can make a, make a big difference. Yeah. And one of the things I advocate in the book is getting a smartwatch, especially if you live alone. Now, I thought about it a little while back and I thought, I'm alone. Uh, so far, I'm healthy. But what if I fall and hit my head? Yep. Or whatever. Anything can happen, even if you're healthy. And you could be lying there. And since I don't work, no one would go, gee, why didn't Joyce show up today? I could be there for days. Right. So if you're going to be alone, especially if you don't have a regular routine where I would notice your absence, you need to have something. And rather than getting a life alert system, I got a smartwatch. Right. And this watch will call 911 if I fall. Right. And don't tell it not to. That's a fantastic piece of advice. So yeah. what, what what would you tell a younger version of yourself? What do you wish you'd known when you were younger that would have helped you thrive even more? As if you're not thriving as it is, but what would have helped to know? Okay, it would have been, don't be afraid to speak up and assert yourself. And I will give you a couple of examples. One is I went to an audition for a musical. They loved my reading I did well in the dance part, and at the, at a certain point, they said, okay, everyone except one or two people can go, and I thought, I never got a chance to sing. Should I say something? I didn't say anything. Well, a couple of years later, the director who was working with me on something else said, we were really thinking about you for the lead, but then we realized we hadn't asked you to sing, and now that I heard you sing, you would have been fine. Oh. <laughs> so I missed that opportunity. Yeah. And another example is that one of the things that Paul had, I mentioned that he had many medical problems. One of the things that he had was he had seizures. Mm -hmm. And they were not obvious because they were not the classic grandma seizures where you fall on the floor. They were what are called absent seizures where he was just out of it. And he also, the first time he had a seizure, he was saying some really odd things. I took him to an emergency room and was diagnosed as a panic attack. And he was sent to psychiatrist for a year and not getting any better. And I would say things like, well, what about the time I called his name and he didn't respond? Or what about this? And I wasn't assertive about it enough. Finally, the third psychiatrist said, uh, well, if you're suggesting that he's having a seizure disorder, which I don't think he does, let's try this for six months. And then we'll, if he doesn't uh, get better, we'll take him to a neurologist. Well, then he had an episode the following week where he said something odd. And I took him to a neurologist and found out that he was actually having seizures. Well, that speaking up is huge. I can yes and that time and time again, especially when dealing with medical problems, with, with medical issues. Because mm -hmm. so often, you know your body, you know your partner's body, you know how they behave, what's normal for them, and what's typical for them may not be what somebody else says. You go, well, so often, I think, people get a diagnosis and go, well, you're just getting old, or you're just, it's just part of, it's just part of aging. Again, when you speak up about what you, what you know. Now, I'm not saying constantly challenge the doctors like eight doctors have told you the exactly the same thing maybe you need to start trying that possible form of treatment as right. is the case with with certain friends of mine who continue to resist the diagnosis I'm like but why don't you give it a try like it's not going to hurt just to 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 maybe take those pills for a couple of days oh wow you feel better okay well maybe they're on the right track here but at the same time yes speak up especially when you know something or you have a question until you're satisfied because you need to be, it's, it's your life. It's your health, right? I talk about a lot as being an advocate. Yes. At medical advocate for others, especially if someone's unconscious. Yes. All had West Nile virus. There was quite a while before he regained consciousness. 
So he couldn't speak up for himself. I had to speak up for him. And at one point, the head of the nursing home said, if it weren't for you, your husband wouldn't be alive now. It That's makes true. a difference. It makes a huge yeah. difference. It makes a huge difference. So something else that we mentioned a little bit earlier when you were talking about not having a boss and all those things, if you have enough money to be okay, I want to talk about money for a minute because aging can get expensive and people frequently kind of underestimate or at a minimum fail to save enough, even if they if they do estimate how much they need to, to have correctly. Uh, and people who've saved enough still worry about outliving their money. What what do you tell people? What's your retirement plan? How's it working out? Have you been able to continue through through retirement and kind of do everything you want to do? Or, or do you still have those worries? Well, I'm very blessed that I have a pension. I could not afford to act if I were depending on acting for an income. <laughs> of course. You know, well, yeah. <laughs> I think I made $1,100 last year. So... <laughs> That is not a possibility. So I'm that, but that's very lucky. Most people don't have that. They have social security. And I do have a number of tips in my book about things uh, like 401ks, IRAs, and what type of IRAs are good. And you definitely need to save before you retire. The other thing that I talk about is I'm a big advocate for long term care insurance. Mm hmm. Because what can totally bankrupt you, it would be going into a nursing home or having extended medical problems without having long-term care insurance. And I got mine when I was 49 <laughs> because your rate, once it's set, it doesn't go up by your age, unlike certain kinds of like life insurance or something keeps in right. you get older. Long-term care insurance you could go in at $1,000 a year, that's it, unless they raise everybody's rates. Right. Well, and that's the, the sad thing about long-term care insurance is it's not really available as much anymore. Uh, yeah. they've, they've disc a lot of these companies got their pants pulled off of them, whatever the term would be. Uh, they lost their shirt when it came to, to long-term care premiums and, and payouts because People got way sicker, needed way more care than they'd forecast. And so Genworth and all these companies have had a, a, a bear of a time. And I know that a couple of people in my life who have purchased long-term care insurance did exactly that. We're in their early 50s when they bought it, I think. And uh, the premium was affordable. And then suddenly they said, mm, yep, uh, nope, we can't do that anymore. So either we can buy you out, you can maintain your benefit at, at this level for and pay no more premiums, or we can double your premiums, or we can uh, to, to give you the benefit originally you'd agreed to. And there, was a, there were a couple of people who've had some trouble with that. But having some form of protection, if it's available to you, and if it's something you can consider and you think it's going to be there, long-term care insurance can be a great deal because, hey, if you if you lose three activities of daily living, as I think is normally the requirement to, to start to make a claim, getting into a care facility, talk about bankrupting people, right? How much it actually costs to get care in a, in a care facility, what? In, in certain metropolitan areas, you can be paying $9,000 a month. And that's Absolutely. way more than most people can afford to do. And that's just for one of you, right? Let's just remember, sure. if you're a couple on a fixed income, spending that kind of money, uh, for, for one, it bankrupts the other one. Then, then what, do I have to sell my house? What am I going to do? How do I, how do I make this work? Is, then becomes the question. And if you have long-term care insurance, yes, that's a... That can be a, a huge benefit. What would you say the biggest missed opportunity is for, for seniors in trying to thrive in their later years? Not trying new activities. There are so many out there with your park district, for example. You go to a park district class, you're paying a very small amount of money. And in fact, I imagine that many of them probably have packages where they would help you if you needed help. I know that my township has senior services that they will help you. They'll sign a caseworker if you request help any problems that you have. 
But I would say mostly being sure to socialize and make new friends. And I think you need to look ahead while you're still married, while you're still working, do some things with your spouse if you're married, but do some things individually. Mm -hmm. Have your own activities and your own friends too, so that if something happens, if you have to retire, if you lose your spouse, you're not left going, well, what do I do now? Everything was couples. Yes. I feel funny going as a single and doing these activities where everyone else is couples, even if I were wanted. So I think it's important to develop your own individual activities and friends in addition to doing things together on a regular basis. Yes. A friend of mine is 101 years old. And she, one of her secrets is the fact that she keeps refreshing her friend group with younger people. Because if you live to be 101, a lot of the people that you knew 50 years ago are not around anymore. Right. And keeping uh, a, a younger group of people percolating up through keeps you active, involved, and engaged in, in new experiences and, and keeps, the, keeps the thing going. That's a huge secret to, to, to again, staying connected and having a, 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 a socialization opportunity out there. So yes, 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 yes. Okay, I have a couple of questions. We're kind of coming to the end. We've talked oh, okay. about, I've really enjoyed our little conversation here, but I like to ask everybody a couple of questions. The first of which is, what do you think the biggest fallacy is that everybody buys into, but that's just total hogwash? And it can be, it, it can be specific to what we've been talking about, thriving and surviving in, in senior life, or broad as far as the world goes. What do you think the biggest fallacy is that everybody buys into? Okay, I have, since I let my hair go gray, I have had a number of people call me dear and honey and <laughs> nice and it's so patronizing <laughs> and in fact i was at a restaurant with a friend and the waitress called her dear honey and she said i am not your honey <laughs> <laughs> and so people think they're being nice oh sweet little old lady we are strong individuals and we want to be treated as equals not at being patronized yep I belong to a grief group. We have trouble getting together because I'm the only one in the grief group, and they are my age, even a few years older, who doesn't work full time. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So don't think that just because someone has gray hair that they don't have interests and abilities and interesting stories to tell. Yep. Don't write them off just because they've got gray hair. I agree. Totally agree. All right. So so on the opposite end of that, what do you feel the most underrated concept is that most people overlook? What what are we missing? Those two seem to tie together. Yes. Yeah. And they, they very much can. I mean, it, it, we're missing the opportunity to engage and respect people who just happen to. If we're writing somebody off just because of the color of their hair or because we perceive a Mm -hmm. an age thing or that they're over or they no longer have anything to contribute, I think we're really missing out on a huge amount of of things. But is there there more? Is there something else that we're overlooking? I find that very often when I meet new people and with a group of new people, to try to get to know them besides asking, oh, where do you live? I'll say, well, what do you do? Or if they're older, I'll say, what do you do or did do? And so often people don't ask me, especially if they're younger, I'll say, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, whatever. Oh, that's very interesting. What kind of law do you practice? It's it's a basis of conversation. And they don't say that to me. They don't ask me, what do I do? And you're going to find a lot of interesting stories there. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. That's how I got a chance to talk to my friend Dan Skidmore, who I interviewed on this podcast several episodes ago. But Dan is a retired rocket scientist who worked wow. for Hughes Aircraft. And <laughs> even that, he's so modest, he won't really tell you what he did until you really probe at it. But he sent 
things to Venus. I mean, he was, he was wow <laughs> engineering. <laughs> and so the, this this guy sitting over in the corner with the thick glasses, kind of just sitting there looking at you, could very well be the person who sent something to the moon. And wow. and what what stories that person must have to tell, and what interesting conversation that might be if you care to actually ask the question, right? Yes, that's, absolutely. That's absolutely it. Joyce, thank you so much for joining me, folks. If you want to know more about Joyce, check out her website, JoycePorter.com, and her book, Mastering Senior Life, Thriving and Surviving, which is available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Links are in the description as always. And until next time, we don't have a problem. We've got an opportunity to thrive and survive.